I, we're here at Nebeu Shalayim and we're working on the mystical Hebrew alphabet. We're up to the letter He. And we're just going to go over for the first few minutes what we covered last time. Um, we were working on the fact that He is the integration of the physical dollar and the spiritual Yud. It brings both together so it's a letter of completion. Masculine words typically in Hebrew lack a he that integrates the physical and spiritual together, like the word yelled is a good example, which is a boy. But feminine words like the word yelda have that integration of the physical and the spiritual together. Yelda with a he is a girl. So we define masculine as, at least from the Torah's perspective, as giving over and affecting outside of yourself. While I'm teaching you Torah, I'm being masculine relative to you. So masculine would be the side of chesed. Chesed is giving. What can I do for you? How can I help you? The feminine side is called the side of taking something, working on it, and raising it to a higher level. So uh, that would be if I'm teaching you Torah, even if I'm a woman, I'm masculine relative to you because I'm giving over Torah and affecting you with it. When I learn Torah from my rabbi, I'm feminine relative to him because I'm going to take what I learned, work on myself, and make myself a better person. Or I'm going to take what I learned, get out there, and make the world a better place. So taking something, working on it, raising it to a higher level is a feminine trait. The mechanism the feminine side uses to take things, work on them, raise them to a higher level is the mechanism called din. Din is rules and limitations. Rules and limitations enable you to take something and raise it to a higher level. The example I used in a previous class is if you're 20 years old and you say by the time you're 25 you're going to be a doctor, as a lawyer, as an accountant, as an engineer, as a psychologist, wow, that's fabulous, but you won't get any. You have to limit yourself down to one career, work on that hard, and then you can become fabulous. Let's say psychologists. Okay, give up the other careers for the next five years, but you can be a great psychologist. If you use rules and limitations, you can take yourself to a higher level. Um, that is a feminine mechanism. So the feminine side is the side of din. Um, that's also what we covered last time. Then we talked about um, strengths and weaknesses in relationships. And uh, women tend to be stronger in relationships because a din mechanism takes a relationship to a higher level. In a man's world, when we give over and we affect outside of ourselves, there's really no natural limitation on the chesed side. And therefore, everyone, everything seems equally outside of us. We marry our wives, we marry our career, we marry the car, we marry the golf game, we marry our health club, we marry the internet, we marry the TV. Everything's equally outside of us. It's hard for us to define essential relationships because we spend our best hours at work or commuting. We come home, we're tired. It's hard to see that the relationship with our wife is a more essential relationship. You need rules and limitations for that. Women tend to be stronger in relationships because rules and limitations means I married him and I didn't marry my career and I didn't marry the internet and I didn't marry the TV and I didn't marry my golf game. I expect more from my relationship with him than I expect from anything else. So that creates a natural strength in relationships. We covered that before as well. So we said if a guy is the side of giving over and affecting outside himself, what is he going to give over and affect? In other words, let's say a guy and a girl set up on a date. So whatever he fills himself up with, that's what he's going to want to give over. So if he's into baseball, he'll talk baseball. If he's into sports, he'll talk sports. If he's into money, he'll talk stocks. If he's into music, he'll talk rap songs. But whatever he fills himself up with, that's what he's going to give over. So the problem with all those categories is they're finite. What if she's not interested in baseball? What if she's not interested in stocks? So it can create a problem when he's giving over. But whatever he fills himself up with, that's what he's going to want to talk about. So we went to the Hebrew spelling of the word for man and woman. The word for man is ish. And it's got that olive shin root. As a matter of fact, both man and woman have that olive shin root. That's the word fire. Fire is your ability to change the state of something. It's a very powerful term in Torah. But his unique letter is a yud. And ish has a yud. And therefore, metaphorically speaking, a man's job is to reach in and up for that yud of spirituality. That's the yud of Torah. That's the yud of how God's running the world. A man's job is to reach up for that yud of spirituality because it floats and give that over. So we men are transmitters of yud into this world. The masculine side is the side of transmitting. So that's why Orthodox Jewish men, no matter whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant, it makes no difference. At least a few minutes a day, we're going to reach up for some yud of Torah and we're going to try to be pipelines of that Torah into the world. That's why your husband will have a stronger mitzvah to learn Torah every day than you will. Because he's got to be a pipeline, a transmission of Torah into the world. Even if it's five minutes a day, even if it's 15 minutes a day, even if it's in the morning before he goes to Wall Street, even if it's on his way home, he stops in synagogue, he 
Davin's Meyerov, and then he learns for a few minutes, but we're all supposed to be pipelines of Yud into this world. Okay, that's reaching up and giving over that Yud of spirituality. What's a woman's unique letter? What's the Isha's unique letter? It's a hey. The root's the same, but she has the hey. So what's the job of the feminine side? The job of the feminine side is a woman goes out into the dollar of the physical world and shows that that dollar of physicality hides a higher level spiritual purpose. The example I used last time, I think, is a car. A car is all about dollar. You know, it's glass, metal, plastic, steel. It's all dollar, dollar, physical, physical, physical. So if you only look at a car as a dollar, of course you want a BMW. You want the best dollar you can buy. What's the problem with that? That's not the word Isha. The word Isha is the woman's job is to go out into the dollar of the physical world and see it hides a higher level of spiritual purpose. That's the Yud hidden inside the dollar. Your job is to express out the potential spirituality hidden in the physical. The feminine side is the side of expression. You express out the higher level spiritual purposes that are hidden inside the physical world. So when a, an Orthodox Jewish woman looks at the dollar of a car, she sees a higher spiritual purpose. She says, this dollar of a car is for visiting the sick, taking food to the poor, taking my kids to school. That's what a car is all about. And therefore, it's not just about dollar. So if that's true, a Toyota works just fine. I don't need to spend an extra $100,000 getting a BMW. What a waste. I can do the same things for $100,000 less with a Toyota. That's your job to show how the physical world hides a higher level spiritual purpose and express that out, right? Now, of course, again, this, relax, this uh, leads back to human biology because Hashem doesn't make mistakes. He created the physical world in a way to teach you to our concepts. So a guy is a transmitter of the idea of a child. Nine months later, she expresses out what that idea was. That's the little baby with the little soul inside. That's only happening on the feminine side. There's no hay on the masculine side. As a matter of fact, Men don't have a dollar. We don't have a dollar. So we tend to have a tougher time relating to the physical world than our wives do. Our wives can see the, the spirituality in the physical world better than um, the husbands do. In other words, we don't have a natural place to put the physical world. Yeah, we've got to deal with it. Yeah, we've got to work in it. But, uh, but ironically, a woman could potentially do better on Wall Street than her husband. Since men don't have a dollar to put all that Wall Street uh, money making 10 hours a day, there's no place for it. So we tend to run the risk of defining ourselves by what we do because we don't have a spiritual place to put that physical. You know, the, we define ourselves by our careers and therefore when we tend to lose our career, we tend to lose our identity. Whereas a woman, she goes down into the dollar of Wall Street, she has a yud of spiritual purpose in there. She can say, listen, I'm not a mergers and acquisitions specialist for Solomon Brothers. I'm a wife and a mother. But I know I'm trained in finance and therefore I can supplement my family's income down here. But the dollar to Wall Street is not who I am. My job down here is to be a spiritual representative of God. I'm, I'm not gonna gossip. I'm not gonna bend the truth to make a deal. I'm gonna be spiritual inside this workplace. And that's a, a, a real strength of the feminine side that the masculine side doesn't have. The example I used last time for this is, you know, when you, um, when you look at an ultra-Orthodox Jewish wedding album, it looks like the photographer was shooting the pictures of the men's size in black and white film, right? <laughs> black pants and white shirts, right? And everyone's just going around in a circle. And you look at the women's side, and if there's any color, it's on the women's side. Why? Because there's a dollar on the women's side that women naturally understand hides a higher level spiritual beauty. It's a higher level purpose. So you can express out the beauty on the feminine side and the men's side's gonna end up boring, right? So being a powerful male is trying to give over and be a pipeline of spirituality in the world. So the obvious question you could ask is one second. If your husband's learning for a few minutes on his way to Wall Street, how does that protect him? How does he has no dollar to put Wall Street in. He's a pipeline for you for 10, 15, 20 minutes. So let's say he does Dafyomi, you know, where he learns a page of Gamora or whatever over a half hour or an hour before he heads off to work. How does that help him all day at work? How does that keep him spiritual all day? 
So if you pretend that yuddha spirituality is like oil, you know, like the oil you pump out of the ground. So if we're bringing, if we're a pipeline for yud of spirituality to the world, even if it's only a few minutes a day before we go into work, that pipeline of spirituality that, that we become a conduit for, so it keeps our pipes oily, even for the rest of the day. Do you follow? It's not like when we stop, we're done. We, we have a vision of God running the world from those few minutes that's going to hopefully stay with us all day. And that's why men are asked to gather on Wall Street in a boardroom to Davin Mincha, you know, at 1.30 in the afternoon. Your husbands will gather to pray in the afternoon in, on Wall Street because Hashem says, okay, it's been a long day. You're starting to lose sight of who you are down there. It's too much dollar for you. It's too much physicality. You got to talk to me. Whereas... The women are not asked to gather in a minion on Wall Street in the middle of the afternoon because you naturally are stronger at seeing the higher level expression of spirituality in the physical world. You're going to see it better on Wall Street than your husbands are. Does that make sense? So we have the stronger mitzvah to check in with God three times a day with a minion and you don't have the same mitzvah because the physical world's not going to typically damage you as much as it will us men. Okay, so now, this leads us to the following paradox, which I also mentioned last time, and that is that the stronger your yud, the further out into the dollar you can go to express out the spirituality of the physical. Remember, you're the side of expression. So that means that the more powerful your yud, your neshama, your soul, the further out into the dollar you can go without being damaged. The further out into the dollar you go without being damaged, the more yud you can bring out of the dollar. The weaker your yud, meaning the weaker your spiritual strength, your spiritual fuel, the weaker your, you've been fueling uh, your soul, the less into the dollar you can go before you get damaged. The less of the dollar you go before you get damaged, the less yud you can bring out of the dollar. Does that make sense? It's like a paradox. In other words, in other words um, you're learning Torah here at Neve Yushalayim eight hours a day and you head to a shopping center to buy a skirt for Shabbat. So you can get in and out of the dollar to the shopping center, get your skirt and come back because you need a skirt for Shabbat. Because your, your neshama is so full of Torah, you get clarity. I'm here because I need a skirt for Shabbat. I'm not at a shopping center because I'm bored. I'm not at a shopping center because it's a hobby to shop. I'm here at a shopping center because the, I need to express out something beautiful for Shabbat because my old skirt is torn or something like that, right? So that means since your yud is powerful, you get into the dollar of the shopping center and you bring out a higher level expression of the physical world. You take a skirt and you say, this is for Shabbat. You take the dollar of a skirt and you say, this is for Shabbat. That's a higher level spiritual expression of a skirt. But if you've been working on Wall Street 10 hours a day for six months and you head home and you say, oh, I need a new skirt for Shabbat. And you pull into this shopping center off the New Jersey Turnpike or wherever it is you live. You know, four hours later, you've been shopping, 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 but you forgot you were there for a skirt. Now you've got a new handbag, new shoes, new outfit, new earrings, new whatever, because it's entertaining, it's fun, it's a hobby, it's whatever. But now the dollar of the shopping center has taken control and you lost sight of the higher level spiritual purpose because you went in there less focused spiritually on why you were there. So the more spiritually powerful your yud, the further into the dollar of the world of Wall Street, of the world of shopping centers, of the world of cars you can go without being damaged. And therefore you can bring out more spirituality from the dollar. The weaker, the more vulnerable you are spiritually, because you're not fueling your yud, the less into the physical world you can go before it takes over and overwhelms you. Okay, that's a very important concept. So when you leave here, you have to understand you must fuel your yud for the rest of your life. Get it by downloading classes off the internet and listen to them in your car as opposed to listening to Top 40 radio or news talk radio or whatever it is you listen to, right? Um, that's one way to feel your good. Go to classes, go to synagogue on Shabbat, whatever it is, but you got to make sure you're fueling your yud constantly because otherwise the physical world will overwhelm you and you'll just lose sight of why you're an expressor of yud out into the world, okay? And this led to the famous drawing of the masculine side is a transmitter of spirituality to the world. So we create what's called the flow down. We are a pipeline of spirituality. That's the yud of Torah. That's the yud of how Hashem's running the world. 
we create a pipeline of that in the world and we give that over without limitation. In other words, we try to bring as much of that into the world as we possibly can. Okay, that's called pipeline giving over that yud. That's the male side. What's the female side? The female side is to take all that that's being given over, limit it down, limit it down, and take it to a higher level. Okay? So therefore, I come home and I say, guess what I learned this week? We should keep kosher. We should put mezuzahs on the door. Uh, we should, uh, uh, whatever it is, we shouldn't gossip. Gossip is lush and hara. Uh, it might hurt people's feelings. God doesn't want us to hurt people's feelings. And I give over all this stuff that I'm being exposed to when I'm learning Torah. My wife's job is to say, one second, the list is too long. Let's just focus on one of these things right now. Uh, one of the things on your list you mentioned was gossip. We're not supposed to gossip? Okay, good. Let's, let's work on not gossiping in our home. Let's play don't gossip games with the kids. Let's review the laws of not gossiping at the Shabbos table. Let's put up reminder notices next to the telephone. And we can make our home gossip free. You see how the feminine side took one of those transmitted ideas and took it to a higher level? Because she understood that if we tried to do all at once, all these beautiful mitzvahs that were pipelining into our house all at once, we'd probably get none of them. But by picking one, you could take it to a higher level. Because otherwise, let's say I come home and I give over all these interesting insights that I've learned. It, if we don't use rules of limitations, we'll get none of them, which means we'll just feel guilty about all of them. Whereas if you take one to a higher level, all of a sudden the home's gossip free, great. Now let's work on the next one. That's a feminine strength. So that's called flow down is transmission. Expression is connection back to Hashem. That's the masculine pipeline and the feminine doing something with it. Okay? And that's how the world runs. And this is the chart called don't stay single. Because you can't fulfill your potential by being one half of the formula. You can't fulfill your potential by just being a pipeline into nothingness. And you can't fill, fulfill your potential by being an expressor if there's nothing there to express. So really, each side is not better than the other. Each side is a half of a whole. I think this chart is also, any questions on this, ladies? I think this chart is also a hint to a deeper idea as to why men wear a kippah. Now, when I was young, I was told men wear a kippa to remind ourselves that there's something above us, meaning God. You put a your head covering on to remind yourself there's something above you, which I think is a beautiful insight. It's nice. And then I, I remember when I was young hearing that in Christ, you know, up until the time of President Kennedy around 1960, um, the custom was for centuries that men always wore hats. President John F. Kennedy, when he went to his inauguration, was like the first president in American history that did not wear a hat to his presidential inauguration. By the next day, because that was considered cool, men stopped wearing hats. But for, you know, for go back a thousand years, men were wearing hats. So like it was one of these. So anyway, in Christianity, they removed their hat when they went into church. Why? Because they said, well, we don't want a barrier or a blockage between us and God. You're like, okay, I hear that. So there's got to be a deeper idea to where we wear a keeper than simply, you know, there's a God above me, uh, even though that's true. So I think the deeper idea is like this. This is what I learned from my Rebbe. What the deeper idea is that if you look at a human being if you look, you'll see this is where I stop, right? This is the finite end of me. I stop here. Judaism says, no, really, my spiritual roots go all the way up into the spiritual realm. The Talmud says that human beings are like an upside down tree. Just like, you know, you look at a tree and you see it's drawing its nourishment from way under the ground in places you can't even find. So too, human beings are like an upside down version of that. My spiritual roots, my soul goes all the way up into the spiritual realm, and I'm drawing my spiritual nourishment from a place you can't find. So therefore, don't think I stop here. Uh-uh. Where I stop is totally hidden. You can't find it because it's going all the way up into the spiritual realm. And therefore, the end of me is hidden. 
I think that's the deeper idea of wearing a kippah, not just to remind me there's a God above me. You, you follow the, the metaphor? If that's true, what obvious question would you ask me? If we're like an upside down tree and our, our spiritual roots go all the way up, then why don't women, women wear a kippah? Because aren't you an upside down tree? Don't you have a soul going all the way up into the spiritual realm and drawing sustenance? And yeah. All human beings have souls that go up into the spiritual realm and draw spiritual flow down. So, so why do men wear a kippah and not women? That would be the obvious question you would ask. And I think the answer is this diagram, right? Because the pipeline of spirituality into the world is actually on the masculine side. Your job is to make the world run correctly as a result. In other words, there has to be a spiritual flow, but something has to happen. Hashem says, I don't send spirituality down to the world for nothing. I send it to make the world a better place. That's the feminine side. Making the world a better place and expressing it out is feminine. So in a certain way, symbolically, that means her kippa is on his head. So if you're single, your kippa is wherever the pipeline of spirituality is flowing to you from. In other words, you open a chumash, you learn a rashi. So since that pipeline is flowing down through rashi, your kippa is on rashi's head. Or wherever you're getting that, that spiritual flow from, that's where the hidden source is coming from. Since that's not your essential job, even though you can do that, your job is to do something with that flow and be an expressor, then you're not, you don't have to wear the constant reminder of the transmission side. You're actually the ones who cause everything to function correctly as a result. So the reminder is on the other side. Do you follow? I think that's also from this chart. Okay, so now, now that we have the masculine side versus the feminine side, transmission versus expression, let's go back to relationships. And let's see where we can apply this in terms of strengths and weaknesses in relationships. So one of the things you have to understand, if as transmitters, in a man's world, everything seems equally outside of him. So therefore, we perceive everything in the physical world as over there. And therefore, if it's over there, it's hard to perceive it as affecting me, right? It's safely over there. So we give over and affect it, but we're not constantly aware of how it bounces back to affect us. You follow? Whereas the feminine side is rules and limitations to take something to a higher level. So that means you can push aside the impact of this, the external world and say, okay, this is essential. I'm gonna focus on this, that's a limitation, and I'm gonna take this to a higher level. Where do we see that spilling over and being hinted to in Jewish law? So I think the easiest example is, are you familiar with the idea that in a Torah-based system of Judaism, men and women don't go mix bathing? Do you ever hear about this? Like, um, in Israel, they actually have separate beaches for religious men and women. Mm -hmm. In Tel Aviv and in Dantanya, and I think in Alad also. Um, and according to uh, Jewish law, since people aren't modestly dressed when they go bathing, um, we have women's beaches for women, we have men's beaches for men. And if you want to go mix bathing, you could with your immediate family, you could with your parents or your siblings or your children but you'd have to find your own private stretch of beach somewhere because once the public's involved and you're not immediately related to these people, so it becomes problematic. Okay, so we're talking about public beaches here, not private stretches of beach. Okay, now, did you know <clears throat> that the, the idea that men and women don't go mix bathing is really focused on the man as opposed to the woman? In other words, if a woman is modestly dressed, Let's say, you know, she's in a uh, uh, shirt with sleeves and skirt and everything like that. She could go sit on the men's side and read a book, right? Um, but if a man's modestly dressed, he can't go sit on the women's side because there are bathing suits over there. So that, that's not fair. If it's separate beaches, it should be separate. How come the women can come over to the men's side and uh, not the reverse? And the answer is, 
because, I mean, let's just say when we go back to masculine and feminine, I think it's hinted to with the following idea we've been working on because let's take a couple who are not religious, a secular Jewish couple. And they go to a beach in Miami or something like that, which has thousands of people in it. So let's put yourself in, in the husband's head. Who's outside of it? So his wife, she's laying on a towel over there, tanning. And the woman over there, 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 and the woman over there. And, the over there. and everyone on a certain weird level is equally outside of it. Because his world is giving over and affecting outside of himself. So in a strange way, he married her, his wife, but he could have married her and he could have married her and he could have married her and he could have married her because everyone's equally outside of him. So the Torah's not saying, well, if you take him to that beach, he's going to look at his wife and look at these other people and say, I want a divorce. The Torah never discusses that. But since marriage is so Kodesh, like the word for engagement is the betrothal's Kedushin, so the which has the root Kodesh. Marriage is so Kodesh that it's almost like Hashem saying, if you take him to that beach and his world is totally externally focused outside himself, he could end up degrading his relationship with his wife and not even know he's doing it. In other words, he could be subconsciously comparing because that's a male weakness because everyone's equally inside of him. And he's not even aware that's going on. But that's a masculine vulnerability. So what are you taking him to that beach for? That's crazy. You could be degrading the marriage and not even aware it's being degraded. I mean, he could be aware it's being degraded, but even if he's not. Whereas she can go to a men's beach, assuming she's modestly dressed, because she married him, and she didn't marry 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 him. She, marry him. she expects more from a relation with him than those other people. So Jem says, well, that's fine then that's not going to pull her down the same way it could pull him down. So you see why it's skewed a little bit there? Does that make sense? Now, nowadays, over the last half century or so, women have been pushed toward adopting male weaknesses um, and therefore, maybe different from a few centuries ago, Maybe it's more likely that women will go to a beach and check out him and check out him and check out him and check out him, in which case it's probably not a good idea to go over to the men's side. But that's not because Hashem did that. That's because society, I think, pushed. You know, I said in previous classes that it's much easier for a guy to go from girlfriend to girlfriend to girlfriend to girlfriend because even though they're all wonderful people and even though he had a great time with each one, they all stayed equally outside of him. Whereas for a woman, once you internalize a relationship, you're trying to take it to a higher level. When he walks away, it can, it can destroy you. It can create tremendous hardship uh, or heartache. So therefore, it's, it's more painful. And a, and a woman's less likely to go from boyfriend to boyfriend to boyfriend as a guy can. So that's actually a feminine strength. You don't want to lose that based on society's pressure to, to make you more male. That's actually a positive thing. So therefore, taking one essential relationship to a higher level is something you want to try to commit to for the rest of your life, and you don't want the male weakness of everyone equally outside of you. Okay, so I think that describes separate beaches sort of in a deeper way than just, okay, Hashem says it's a bad idea. Okay, you, you follow? Now, just to put it in historical perspective, um, until a certain point in recent history, I don't know if you know this, but public beaches were separate. I mean, for our generations, like whoever heard of, you know, you have to go to Israel, right, to find a separate beach. But, you know, the United States has thousands of miles of coastline. It's impossible to find separate beaches in the United States. Maybe, you know, if you find a from hotel somewhere or something like that, there's a separate beach in front of it, but it's not the norm. But did you know if you go back 100 years or so, separate beaches were the norm? Did you guys know that? In other words, if you went to a public beach in Europe, so up until recent history, there were men's beaches and women's beaches because that was called normal. We don't have a sensitivity to that anymore. But um, from what I understand, the first mixed beach in Europe was in England around 1918. Now, 1918 is not that long ago. That's my grandparents, around the time my grandparents were young. 
1918 is not that long ago. And yet that was the first mixed beach in Europe. It was in England. And did you know if you went to that mixed beach, you had to wear a bathing suit, right? Men wore shirts and pants. Women wore dresses with sleeves and it was called a bathing suit, like a suit, right? Nowadays it's bathing pieces of material, but in the old days it was a suit. So did you know that not only did you have to wear a bathing suit, which means in a public beach you had to be covered, but if you came off the beach in your bathing suit, the police would give you a ticket and you had to pay a fine. And you were covered. This is only, what, 90 years ago or something? hundred. I mean, like, this is not that long ago. So, so what did they understand that we don't have a clue about anymore? How come if you came off the beach in a shirt and pants or in a dress, the police gave you a ticket and you had to pay a fine? And don't say because the suits were ugly. They wouldn't give you a ticket for ugly. Do you know why? You, you got a ticket and you had to pay a fine? Because the suits were? Wet. And what they understood is a wet suit's not a suit. It's called skin. So once it's skin, it's not modest. You had to put on a robe. When you came off the beach, you had to put on a robe. If you didn't, you got a ticket. Is that unbelievable? Like, imagine the sensitivity. That's only 100 years ago. And, and beaches were separate. So if that's true, then, then it, according to that logic... How come nowadays, you know, people walk down the streets of Manhattan in like leotards or bodysuits or whatever? So in my grandparents' generation, you got a ticket for that. Because that's not called clothing, that's called a layer of skin. And people said, well, that's not modest, put on a robe. And now people are walking down the street looking like they're gonna go take a shower or something. So there's no sensitivity. So how come we lost the sensitivity? And I have a theory. I wanna give you my theory as to why society lost that sensitivity from something that in the early 20th century everyone understood. And I'm not a sociologist, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Um, I think that in the 1940s um, and into the 1950s, what caused society to lose its sensitivity was that birth control became extremely effective extremely inexpensive and extremely accessible in your local pharmacy. And once that happened, those three things happened, all of a sudden, a part of a relationship, an intimate part of a relationship, which was about marriage, became recreational. And it was, you no longer needed a marriage commitment because you know, for the last thousand years beforehand, so if people um, had an affair outside of marriage, so somebody would get pregnant, somebody got caught, or if, if uh, boyfriends and girlfriends lived together, somebody got pregnant, it was embarrassing. But all of a sudden, in the middle of the 20th century, that changes, and, and, and nobody gets caught or nobody gets embarrassed, and all of a sudden, you get, in the, by the time you hit the 1960s, it's the hippie movement, remember? So what's the hippie movement? If it feels good, do it. So all of a sudden, uh, an intimate part of a committed relationship through marriage for the rest of your life was no longer necessary. And therefore, what became a part of marriage became recreational. Once it's recreational, then I think a sensitivity to modesty went out the window. I mean, wasn't that kind of the forefront? I mean, obviously there are other for like the feminist movement, like what birth control? Yeah, it could be. I mean, but do you understand that that for thousands of years, people understood what was modest and what wasn't, and then in the span of a few decades, nobody has a clue about it anymore. I, I really think it was just a, a, a paradigm shift because of relation, the nature of relationships changed fundamentally, and therefore affairs didn't get you caught in. And why get married? You don't need to get married. You can recreate a marriage relationship without getting married. All of a sudden, everything changes, and then all of a sudden, people aren't dressing modestly or sensitive. No. I was thinking about, like, how did I graduate sociology a couple of times. Mm. Check my theory, will you? When I you know, I like, definitely, like, I think it has a lot to do with that, along with, like, you know, like, the war and all this thing. But birth control definitely, like, when it come, I, I could see that. But at first I thought, like, yeah, you know, the reason that, you know, men and women were, are women are a lot of, I was thinking from the woman's side, a lot of our bathing suits, the feminist women, obviously, it, it couldn't be, it could be from a side of, like, you know, 
oppression and I think it started that. before the feminist movement. I think, I think Hollywood may have had a lot. Men were also fined for the same exact thing. Then I don't think it's an oppressive. I don't know. I don't know. I know women were fined. I don't know. If, I don't remember. For, being was just... for coming off the beach in the wet. Oh, you don't know if men were? I'd have to. Because I can have a lot. Because I don't know. But I think Hollywood also yeah. it changed people's set level of sensitivity yeah. in the 30s and 40s yeah. when you saw on the big screen a new level of fashion that maybe was not as public. But again, we'd have to check with sociologists. Okay, so that's male weaknesses and, and uh, masculine and feminine in terms of expression. And we'll continue. Uh, I don't know if I teach you guys tomorrow. Tomorrow's Wednesday, right? Maybe Thursday uh, with more on the letter. Hey, we're almost done. Mm -hmm.